Hi, this is Lynn Ackerman from Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, and I'm here today with Dr. Jennifer Anger, also from Cedar sinai um, who is a esteemed professor of urology there, as well as the Associate Director of Urologic Research. And also her role here today is as the chairman for the committee from the AUA Guidelines uh, Organization to to present uh, to us the summary of recurrent uncomplicated urinary tract infections in women uh, AUA guidelines that were just recently um, published this past uh, uh, winter. Dr. Inger, welcome. Thanks for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. That's great. So I wanted to just start off by asking sort of what was the big reasoning behind uh, behind sort of the formulation of these guidance? Why did the AUA feel there was a need for guidelines discussing recurrent urinary tract infections? How big a problem really is this? This is a very large problem. One in two women will get an infection and of those about half will end up with recurrent infections, which we define as three infections in, uh, in a year versus two in six months. What's happened is, I mean, when, when I trained in urology uh, in the late 90s, anyone who had urinary tract infection symptoms would get what we call fluoroquinolone or like Cipro. And we, did, we would just give it over the phone and didn't say, hey, we really need to check this urine culture. And what happened was this huge, um, wave of development of resistant organisms in the community. And now we're facing very uh, dangerous bacteria and they're harder and harder to treat with time. Um, the other thing that we've, we've found is that antibiotics have side effects and that's another really important um, issue we need to take into account when we treat women with recurrent infections. So let's talk a little bit more about that. You mentioned the side effects to individuals. Um, tell me a little bit more about that concept. What is it, why is it important and what are we trying to avoid? So, you know, I love, I love this uh, Schwarzenegger movie. When we talk about collateral damage in this field, it's, it implies um, that there's damage from antibiotics that um, were not wanted, that don't have to do with the actual infection you're treating, but other um, damage that occurs. So what we see for one is when you um, use an antibiotic to kill one bacteria, the, um, often we develop, it, it, the other bacteria that can live become resistant. And then when we multiply treat the same person with recurrent infections, we see them developing bacteria that become harder and harder to treat, that, they're, that re they're resistant to more and more um, antimicrobials or antibiotics. And occasionally there's no oral regimen that works and we have to um, admit the patient and give them IV antibiotics. Other um, collateral damage is um, commonly what we talk about as side effects. So a typical one is we treat a woman with um, spectrum for a urinary tract infection, and then she gets a yeast infection. And that's what we consider maybe more minor collateral damage. But then we see people getting bad um, GI tract infections, such as Clostridium difficile, and they can get very sick from that. So the whole microbiome of the body can change. And um, I would actually have Dr. Ackerman speak to that because she's truly our <laughs> microbiome expert. <laughs> well, that's great. So what, what exactly is the difference between this concept of collateral damage and the concept of antibiotic stewardship, this, this idea that we hear a lot about being stewards for antibiotics in, uh, and, and how they're used in the community? So the concept of antibiotic stewardship really is talking about us as providers taking charge and being very careful when we give antibiotics. So the most important thing that we can do um, is, is treat based on urinary cultures. And I think that's one of the most important take home messages um, was from our, our new guidelines was that we don't do the phone call, we'll treat you anymore. Although re recently with COVID, I've actually been doing a little more of that and I feel guilty and terrible. And I say, <laughs> I, I really hate doing this, but I'm gonna give you your antibiotic without a culture. But um, with rare exception of a patient who um, 
who has um, done what's called self-start therapy, um, we, we, we choose to have a patient come in and drop off a sample before we treat with antibiotics. And the other um, important point about antibiotic stewardship is that we want to give an antibiotic that will treat the infection with less collateral damage than other antibiotics. Specifically, we try to avoid, avoid those fluoroquinolones, which have been shown to cause many side effects. Um, even though that was a drug of choice when I was training, we've seen now that there's risk of you know, Achilles tendon rupture, people get symptomatic muscular pain with ciprofloxacin. And so we're really trying to avoid basically those big guns that we don't really need. That's great. So let's talk a little bit more about the type of patient that we're talking about. Who are, are the patients most affected by urinary tract infections and by recurrent UTIs as well? In our guideline, we focus on the index patient, which is a healthy woman with normal anatomy and who has culture proven infections. And when we say recurrent, we mean two in six months or three in the last year. And they're associated with, with acute onset symptoms. And the most, um, the most diagnostic symptom is dysuria or burning with urination. So if a patient calls and they've had, you know, th three months of, of urinary frequency without any kind of fevers or other types of systemic symptoms, does that sort of qualify even if they have some dysuria or is that kind of a different situation? That is a different situation. And in our practice, we see a lot of women who are convinced they have a, a UTI that's not going away. And when you really look at their, their cultures, they haven't necessarily been positive, um, or maybe they were positive once and then they end up with persistent symptoms. So long-standing symptoms, we tend to think of other potential sources of pain, interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome. Um, you can have a yeast infection causing burning, that atrophic vaginitis, which we see um, causing symptomatic burning in older women. That is, um, that is not associated with an actual infection. Great, so when we're talking about that first evaluation, so you're seeing a patient for the first time um, who comes in and they're concerned about recurrent urinary tract infections. You just mentioned a bunch of other possible diagnoses. So what's your workup, you know, what does the guideline recommend in terms of that initial workup when a patient comes into you worried about recurrent infections? The most important part of the workup is to make sure that what they've had, meaning when they tell you they've had infections, we want to make sure that those were culture proven, not just, um, you know, this sort of that where they think they have an infection because because we don't want to potentially over treat someone who has, let's say, atrophic vaginitis. So the, the key is that those prior episodes did in fact demonstrate um, an actual urinary tract infection in, uh, as um, demonstrated by the urine culture. And then we wanna make sure there's no complicating factors like a fever indicating a complicated urinary tract infection or kidney infection um, and other, uh, other features that may um, predispose, you know, may, may suggest that this isn't what we call a, an uncomplicated infection. Great. So for the majority of those uncomplicated patients, other than that initial assessment where you've reviewed their labs, you've talked to them about their symptoms, you've done an exam, you know, is there any other imaging or laboratory testing at that visit when maybe they're asymptomatic that's needed before you can kind of go on and determine a treatment plan? We don't need to do any further workup. And that's often um, disappointing to patients because many times their primary doctors, when they refer to us, they'll say, you need a cystoscopy. And so sometimes it, our visit involves some re-education that no, we really don't at this point. This is something we, um, you know, it's common. You don't have any complicating features.
Great. So the, I noticed I'm, I, we've got the algorithm up right here that's sort of a summary of a lot of the uh, individual guidelines. Um, and there are kind of two branches. If you don't mind, let's talk a little bit about that antibiotic treatment branch, which is more uh, talking about the specific treatment of acute onset symptoms and how we make a decision to, to go ahead and, and treat those patients. What are sort of important things for that a, a treatment of the of the acute episode that we are assuming is cystitis um, in terms of, you know, what antibiotics are you thinking of giving and are there any other things you need to consider when you're when you're dealing with that acute episode? Absolutely. So we have the um, basically the three first line antibiotics include macrodantin or nitrofurantoin. Uh, Bactrim or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and phosphomycin, also known as monurol. And the reason these were selected is they've shown to be effective as uh, treatment regimens, and they typically have a minimal, route of, a minimal amount of collateral damage. So um, nitrofurantoin is typically given twice daily for five days. Bactrim has better tissue penetration. So trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is given twice a day for three days. Phosphomycin is a three gram powder, which is mixed in, in water. And that's given as a one time only dose. Now this is actually an older antibiotic that has come, come back into use because of its efficacy treating ESBL. And so, um, unfortunately, it tends to not be readily covered by insurance in the United States. So sometimes it requires prior authorization to get, but I do anticipate that will um, gain further uh, wide, widespread use over time. That's great. So let's say that a patient comes in and says to you something like, you know, every time I get an infection, you know, my prior doctor would give me 14 days because it seems to take that long for me. Is that is that really something that's that's recommended? Is that a good practice that if somebody's had recurrent infections that you consider extending the dose regimen or or increasing it or anything like that? Right. And that is a, a really important point we don't want to increase the length of treatment. And we see that commonly done in practice where patients will have five days of treatment, let's say with nitrofurantoin, and they still have symptoms, so their dose is lengthened for another, you know, another five days. And well, if someone has symptoms that don't uh, respond to a course of antibiotics, we recommend highly that you get a culture on that patient before treating with a second course of antibiotic. But increasing the length for simple cystitis is not necessary. Great. Now let's get back to maybe that other arm of the guidelines where we have the prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. So what's the reasoning behind, you know, really strongly recommending um, prophylaxis instead of just intermittently treating any cystitis episodes? Prophylaxis is low dose antibiotics that can be given as often as every day or for women who are sexually active and get infections related to sexual activity, they take it at the time of sexual activity within one hour before or after. The goal of prophylaxis is to avoid getting the cystitis. So we have patients who come to us and they're so tired of antibiotics, this is often like the last thing they wanna do but I often spend a little time just saying, look at how many infections you've had and look at how many antibiotic pills you've taken. If you go on this prophylaxis, you'll actually be taking fewer pills per month and you can avoid that infection, which is causing an inflammatory response in your bladder. So often um, that will be enough to convince a patient to try it. And we have some non-antibiotic prophylactic reg regimens that are that are um, starting to show promise. That's great. So let's talk a little bit about some of those regimens. What are some easy recommendations for patients if you're trying to get them started on, on this kind of prophylactic regimen to prevent infections? For antibiotic prevention, it really is the same drugs that are in our um, list of primary treatment. And we also have cephalexin or keflex 
which can be given prophylactically. So here you see Bactrim low dose. Um, uh, trimethoprin alone at 100 milligrams is a great preventive dose for people who have a sulfa allergy. For those who don't, you can have trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole single strength once daily, or um, also some people uh, will prescribe three times weekly. Uh, Nitrofurantoin can be given 50 milligrams daily. That's my preferred prophylactic regimen. Um, because of the low rate of collateral damage, in particular for women, there's a low rate of yeast infections that occur with this. It can also be given at 100 milligrams daily, which can be effective for some people. And then we have cephalexin at 125 milligrams or 250 daily, and phosphomycin, which actually can be used prophylactically um, once every 10 days. That's great. And I noticed for perimenopausal and postmenopausal women, there were some additional recommendations. Can you comment on the, the use of vaginal estrogen as a potential prophylactic agent? Absolutely. We see peaks of recurrent UTIs for women who on, at the time of onset of sexual activity, usually in the late teens, early 20s, as well as menopause. So what happens is um, we always say a healthy vagina is an acidic vagina. And after menopause, the vagina loses acidity, it becomes more basic, and then the good bacteria, which we think of as probiotics or preventing infections, get overtaken by bacteria that can actually cause urinary tract infections. So to avoid this, we give vaginally dosed estrogen, which is very effective in restoring the vaginal acidity and then also restoring the good vaginal flora. So here you see, um, you, this can be given in a tablet form, in a ring form that can be changed every three months, as well as vaginal creams, which are given um, first a loading dose of a, a daily dose for two weeks, and then two to three times weekly. Wonderful. That's so helpful. Thank you so much. And uh, I think we have one more slide, which gives us uh, the way to access the return UTI guidelines from the AUA. Anything else you want to make sure that I that I didn't cover in our in our questions today? I think the the American Urologic Association has done a great job in in making us take responsibility for our use of antibiotics. And I think that these next few years will hopefully show a reduction in resistance. And the one other thing I wanted to add is um, the resistance patterns that we see are very dependent on our local, what we call a local antibiogram. So it's very important that, uh, that providers know what that is because many places I know in Los Angeles, there's a high incidence of resistance to trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. So you want to know what your what is the antibiotic resistance, um, what does it look like in your community, and you can find that out through your own hospital's microbiology laboratory. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure having you with us today. Oh, thank you for having me.